guys. Rex, thanks for having me here. Um, thank you guys for, for coming tonight. Um, my name is Kat Berman. I am co-founder and CEO of C-Note. Tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing at C-Note, where we're going at C-Note, and most importantly, hoping to share some lessons learned. Um, I think there's some genius minds in here that are probably working on some great things, and so if we can do anything to be helpful in speeding that up or um, provide some some, some fails or some um, learnings, then, then we hope to do that tonight. There we go. So a little bit about what we uh, do at CNote. So we create financial products embedded with positive social impact. We actually don't think you need to trade off doing something really powerful with your money and putting more money back into your wallet and doing good things in the world. We don't know why it got bifurcated or when it got bifurcated. We actually don't believe it has to stay um, that misaligned. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we're doing this um, and what that impact and what that return looks like. But as you can see, um, our aim is to do high return and high impact. So just a little bit about the story. Um, you wouldn't know it by looking at me, but I actually come from an Argentine family. My mom's from Buenos Aires, and I grew up in a very, very Latin um, household. We ate dinner at 9 o'clock at night. We had these large asados, lots of dulce de leche. Um, and, and, you know, I share that to say that I grew up mostly with that as my culture, because in our family, the mom really drove what the household was about. Um, and I didn't really recognize or appreciate that. I just knew that I was the weird one that spoke Spanish. Um, everyone thought my abuela was our maid, the whole thing. And as I grew older, I realized that the gift that that gave me was a sense of other. So I always navigated the world a little different. I kind of walk into a room and try to figure out what was what. I was a little bit intimidated for folks to know I spoke Spanish or that my family, some of my family members didn't speak English. And so walking around with that little bit of sense of other gave me a really interesting lens on the world. And I think as, as entrepreneurs and innovators, many of us in this room have probably had that sense of other. And I don't mean the obvious one where you're like the only guy or the only girl in the room where you're showing up you know, in underwear or anything, but I mean that really slight one where you, you know you're different, but maybe everyone else in the room doesn't know yet. And I actually think that's a real strategic advantage. So I just plant that seed of if you've ever had that sense of being different or other or a different perspective, I actually think that's a really powerful force when you think about building companies, building products, uh, and building the future. So a little bit about my background. Um, definitely not linear. Um, I went through a bunch of different uh, career trajectories. I worked at some Fortune 500 companies. I worked at some small companies. I worked in nonprofits. I worked in for profits. Uh, and really, the common theme for me was around three things. And it took me years later, hindsight, to get what the common threads were. But really, they were around a love of business. I've always loved market forces. I really enjoyed competition and sales and what inspires people to grab that thing and actually purchase it. And so, I've always loved business. I also always loved problem solving, almost like the juicier and harder the better. So I have this like sick addiction to problem solving. And the last is social justice. So again, growing up in a Latin family, especially with an immigrant mom who grew up here very poor in the United States, um, just a sense of equality of, the, of this idea that each of us absolutely deserve a chance, um, an opportunity for economic freedom. But you guys have probably heard this phrase, you know, talent is universal, opportunity is not. Right? You can find a lot of amazing, ambitious people throughout the world, but the opportunity to do something with that is actually reserved for quite a few people. Um, and so social justice was a real big thing for me. And so I kept finding myself wanting to use the skills of business and problem solving, but not to build a million plastic widgets, but to actually solve major social inequities. And so that's this common theme, and I use that in the various parts of my background. So I ended up doing entrepreneurship. This is actually my third company. Uh, I went into venture capital for a while, about four years, worked in traditional finance, managing director at Schwab. Um, and, and so all of those things wrapped together informed where I am today with CNO, but really with those underlying three themes of business, problem solving, and real passion for social justice. And so this brings us to Finance, And I think I'm in a room of people who would agree that today's finance, the status quo, is completely unacceptable. A lot of different ways, and you know, think about that term for a second. 
whatever that means to you, but there's so many pieces of traditional finance that are absolutely unacceptable. Whether it's the inequality, whether it's the fees, a lot of cool stuff that Tally's working on, just there's so many pieces of it that are unacceptable. And I had a front row seat in, in that when I worked in traditional financial services. I worked at a very large company, went into the belly of the beast, just to figure out, like, how do they think about this? And, and you know, what are they doing to kind of problem solve with some of these inequities? Lovely group of people, and also learned there was very little they were going to do anytime soon. And then, in fact, most of the products and services that were being built in traditional finance and service, financial services were to make the wealthy wealthier. Not surprising to this group, but that was one of my three aha moments of most of the products and services that I was being paid to build were actually not going to do anything to level the playing field in the United States. The second aha I had working in traditional financial services, which is what I call the brick wall syndrome. And this is the idea that right now, in finance, in the status quo of finance, most Americans treat their finances like a brick wall. And by that I mean we find a financial institution we kind of trust, because most of us don't totally trust them at this point, but we kind of trust them. We take whatever money we have, small or large, and we throw it over a brick wall to them, hoping that they don't do anything bad with it. Literally, throwing it over the brick wall. Because most of us as Americans have no idea what's over that brick wall. We have actually no idea how our savings is being used, how our checking is being used. It's not sitting in a gray vault at night, right? It's being used, but we have no idea how. What are, what's in our 401k? So again, it's our money. We work really hard for it. And yet we all have subscribed to this brick wall syndrome. I should say all, but many of us, of taking our money, giving it over to a financial institution, and just hoping they don't do bad things with it. The fact that this brick wall exists, and the fact that we don't know how they're using our money, to me, is nothing short of shady. Absolutely shady that that's happening, and yet that's the status quo in finance. So I figured, well, we could probably do better than that. So that was my second aha. And my third aha working in traditional financial services was when you actually go over the wall and look at how they're using your money, it's really depressing, right? You hope to climb the wall and see like grass and unicorns and rainbows and they're using it for all kinds of safety world things, and of course they're not, right? Most financial institutions are using those dollars for their profitability, right? Not for your pocketbook, number one. Definitely not for your financial health. And that's seen by all the types of wonderful new fees most of us have to in, uh, embrace, uh, or doing anything that's remotely good in terms of um, leveling the play, playing field. So seeing what's over the wall is almost worse than even looking at the wall. And it's with all of that in mind that I was inspired to create something different. Because I sat in my big cushy office and thought to myself, I could just sit here and be part of the problem, or I could get out of here and create some solutions. And that's a bit more of my speed. And so I left and started this company called Zeno. And so the idea here, after learning about a lot about what traditional finance was doing and, and the, the big gap between what a lot of consumers were looking for, made me think, well, hmm, if I could start from scratch, if I could rethink what's behind the wall, what would that look like? What would we expect? If we could break down that wall, what would we want to see? And it came down to three things. Number one, make my money work harder, right? All of us spend a lot of time behind our desks or on our computers doing our job. If I'm going to give you my money financial institution and I'm going to empower you to do something with it, I want you to make it work very, very hard because I work really, really hard for it. So competitive returns was number one. The second was simplicity. Also, I don't really have time to deal with this, and so can you just do it for me? Can you just, can you make it so simple to be financially smart and financially healthy? Just simplicity, make my life easy. And the third is, make me feel good about how you're using my money, right? Don't make me look over that wall and realize you're using it to fund tobacco and drugs and all kinds of things that I don't believe in, right? Use it to do, to create a more equitable world. I know you can do it. And so that's really the pillars that we started with at Sino, of how do we start rethinking what finance can do and who finance can serve with these pillars of competitive returns, super simple,
and align with our values, right? So, I don't want to do this alone. Uh, this is my amazing friend, Yulia Tarasova. She is the COO of CEDO. Um, despite being gorgeous, she's also brilliant. Uh, she's former Wall Street executive, co-led a $10 billion risk management function, just absolutely amazing mind, and also equally passionate about using finance as an instrument for positive change. So I shared with her my crazy idea that I thought we could do a lot better with financial products, and she said, I think so too. So together we started this journey. All right, so that's nice. Really interesting thought process. And then the question is how? How do you actually bring that to fruition, right? Up until now, it's a really great story in a movie, but how do you actually create in a highly regula right, regulated environment these magical products and services I'm talking about? And so we started really just exploring, right? What would be some really interesting ways to reinvent products to get us to better yields, simplicity, and value alignment. And we actually uncovered an awesome one. So raise your hand if you've ever heard of a CDFI. Three, we'll leave right here. <laughs> Amazing, three is more than most. So again, with all the finance people I'm surrounded by, oftentimes it's zero, so amen to the folks who know it. Very quickly, CDFIs, the easiest way to think about them are nonprofit lenders. If you think about San Francisco and you think about the Ferry Building and some of your most beloved restaurants or cafes or um, you know good stores, about half of those stores were funded by CDFIs. So what happens is in the U.S., a lot of small businesses, a lot of affordable housing, a lot of the things that we love in our communities are actually not funded by banks anymore. It's a dirty little secret. Why? The business model of banks oftentimes doesn't work in the favor and it's just not a good fit. And so who steps in to fund the small businesses, the first time entrepreneurs, the affordable housing, the schools and low-income communities? CDFIs. Nonprofit, nonprofit community lenders uh, on a mission to provide fair and responsible capital, certified by the Treasury Department. So I've already hooked you on their do-gooders, right? You get that they're do-gooders and they're building all the things in our communities are proud of. What you don't know about them is they're actually one of the most high-performing asset classes out there. In fact, the Senior Vice President of Bank America about two weeks ago just issued a public statement talking about the fact that repayment from CDFIs rivals any other asset class that they work with. They're incredible, incredible financial performers as well. So then you're going, okay, why haven't I heard of them? Even more, Every major bank already uses these guys. So these guys have existed for 20 years. They're certified by the Treasury Department. They actually outperformed FDIC institutions in the last recession. So they're better, they're performing better than banks, but none of us have heard about them. And the reason is banks and foundations have had a, had a monopoly on them. They've had a wonderful, lovely secret club of them for years, and they get their return and they get their social impact, and everyone's happy. And what occurred to us was that was kind of focused. Because we figured, why doesn't everyone in this room also get to get great returns that are already proven and that also do really good things in the world? So we started trying to figure out why. Why is it that no one's heard of these guys and no one's been able to use these guys, except for large banks and foundations? And oh boy, what we found is there were at least seven easy hurdles of why this has never been done before. And I can bore you with all of them, but everything from there's over a thousand, the diligence is insane, their balance sheets are crazy, and I can go on and on. There were a lot of hurdles to overcome to unlock what was an awesome asset class, but none of us in this room could really access it unless we were big with it. And so what we realized was the key to unlocking this at scale was technology. And so what we realized we need to do is take those seven hurdles piece by piece and figure out what we could build and what we could buy and finally unlock this at scale. And that's what we're doing. These are the four technologies building just to unlock the CDFI asset class. My head of engineering is here tonight, and he can certainly talk at length with these, but just gives you a general sense of what we've had to build to actually pull this off so each of us in this room can have these better products. And it's not a small opportunity. So what we started with was what we call the gateway drug, which is cash. 
So whether you have cash right now sitting in a savings account, a checking account, a brokerage account under your mattress, you are likely not making enough to even keep up with inflation. So what we were able to do with our technology was actually build a cash instrument, let's see if I have, it. nope, that, there we go, that gives you 30 times better return on your cash than your bank. It takes less than three minutes to sign up, mycino.com. No fees, because that would be obnoxious. No minimums, because that's not democratizing finance. And oh, by the way, every single dollar, every single penny you put into that account is going to create a more equitable nation. So what do I mean by that? What is this impact of which I see? Every dollar that goes into this account goes to fuel these nonprofits for social good. I'm going to just give you one story, but I have a lot more. Dollars that go into your C note account fuel first time women entrepreneurs, they fuel minority businesses, they fuel low income communities, they fuel affordable housing, you name it. One story I could give you is this is Cindy Dolphin, real human being, four time cancer survivor, first time entrepreneur. After four cancer treatments, she realized on her outpatient, she had to leave every time with this big cord pulling some of the liquids away from the operated spot. And it was obnoxious. It is, for any of you who have experienced cancer or friends or family, you already know that it is such a taxing, trying, and dehumanizing experience. And on top of this, now she had to race around with this thing coming out of her fluxing, right? It's very non-functional. So she decided that she was going to design her own, since nobody else was. So she designed this beautiful pouch to carry this out treatment device. It grew very popular. So popular that the doctors and the nurses that treated her wanted them for their patients. So popular that other hospitals wanted also this wonderful device. And she did not have the money to do any of this. She had no inventory. She had no sales team. She had no, right? She had no distribution channel. And so she needed to find dollars to help build her business. And these are the types of projects that these nonprofits fund. And so through C-Note Investments, Cindy got a loan. Cindy was able to hire her first folks. And now Cindy runs a very popular, profitable business, not only giving others employment, not only showing that women are great entrepreneurs, but also providing a lot of these cancer survivors a sense of dignity with this really wonderful device. Just one example of the type of change your dollars can do when they don't sit in a traditional account. So I talked a little bit about that. What's next? That's just a taste That's just a taste test. That's just a taste test. When you think about your dollars, when you think about how they go to work, we've all gotten so um, used to the status quo of, ah, I just use it for credit, but, ah, I just use it for mortgage, ah, right? Just use it, whatever you use, your, use my dollars, whatever it takes. But if you actually impact this and realize that your dollars sitting in whatever it is right now can be used as an instrument of change, the things we can do in this country are tremendous. Imagine financial products that helped us with disaster relief. We've seen unprecedented disasters, force majeures, fires, floods. What if we could help rebuild communities through things like our 401k arm savings account? Okay? If you think about domestic violence, one of the products we're working on right now is the number one reason women and men stay in bad situations in harassment and violence is financial security. What if our investment dollars could do something about that? So it is absolutely a long cycle of products and opportunity that we can do if we rethink how our investment dollars go to work. That's what we're doing at C-Note. <coughs> I wanted to share a little bit about a few lessons learned. Hopefully these are helpful. Some of these you may know. Because it's not been a smooth journey, as you can imagine, right? As, as Rex said, you know, um, we're SEC qualified. We went through that lovely and long process. Um, you know, we're a regulated company. Uh, and so we learned some lessons along the way. I think the first one, which most of you probably already know, which is the currency of finance is trust. Early on in the journey, we came out with our first website. It was very fancy and very animated and all this kind of stuff. And we couldn't understand why our first beta testers kept pushing back. And it's because we didn't have trust. We didn't have the credibility of partnerships, of assets. We didn't do a good job telling our story of our backgrounds. 
And so we learn very quickly that it doesn't matter how fancy or fabulous or even helpful your product is if nobody trusts you. So building trust on your platform with your potential customers is number one. The second unfortunate lesson we learned, and I share this more out of humor, is um, we went through an accelerator early on, uh, and when we graduated, we got a piece of advice, which was, you know, I know you guys are a fintech startup. I just want you to know that you can really do whatever you want. You're so tiny, the SEC is never going to watch you. Go out there and just experiment, do whatever you want. Like, you're too tiny, they'll never care. True, true story. My co-founder and I walked away and both go, ha ha, we would never do that. But still, that is real advice we got. And I want to give you a punchline to that story. When we were first building product and we were going through the SEC process, um, we started putting a splash page up to test out what we wanted the look and feel of our splash page to be. And we put up, probably for like a couple weeks, the CDFI fund logo. So I talked about the CDFI fund at the Treasury Department, actually, which just was them last week. Awesome, just to put it up there, right, placeholder. We got a letter from the government saying do not use the US Treasury CDFI logo with that information. Tiny little startup, hadn't even launched yet, and we got a letter from the government. Again, not a big deal, there was no legal anything, but it was a beautiful example of don't let anyone tell you, as a FinTech company, that you do not have to have the responsibility and eye on compliance of any large finance. So that's my bad advice. The third lesson I wanted to share is just about choices. Um, another thing we learned early on is that choices can just be paralyzing. You know, something what we thought about early is maybe you want to decide where your dollars go. Maybe you want to, you know, maybe you want to fund the environment and you want to fund uh, women entrepreneurs and you want to fund affordable housing and, and let me give you seven projects each and you can decide. But what we learned is no, you don't. You do not want to decide that. Most of our, uh, what we call members, most of our consumers, they don't want to decide. They do want to feel heard, and they do want to have a voice in terms of what they care about, but picking the individual products, or even the, indi I mean, the individual projects, or even the individual nonprofits, is like, no way. So choice, salut, choice can also just be paralyzing. So having that nice tension or that nice uh, mix of enough choice where you feel heard and represented, but not so much choice you're like, what do I do with this information, was a really important balance for us to learn. <coughs> the next lesson we learned was too good to be true. And this is something I think is a real issue with FinTech. Um, all of us want to create the next generation of finance and make it so much better than what today is. <laughs> However, there is a, uh, I think there is a limit where folks start going, huh? One of the things we tested early on was we made it so simple to sign up. I told you, you know, if you go right now to mycnot.com, you literally can do it in the next three minutes and sign up and open an account. We made it so early, so easy early on, with zero friction, zero anything, that folks started to question it. They literally were like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you talking about? Great return and da da da. And it was, it was, I got this feedback again and again and again. People were actually asking for just a little bit of friction to make it more believable. Shocking, I know, because trust me, it was shocking to us. We're just like, we did it! And then we're like, oh, nobody wants this. Like, let's put up here. And so we had to learn that a little bit of friction can actually be a good thing. And I'll just tell a very funny story that I just heard last night, which was, if any of you have made those like ready-made cupcakes or things where like it's a Betty Crocker and you know you have the mix and you have to throw in like two eggs and some water and you're like I made cupcakes I'm amazing right? Apparently when Betty Crocker and all of those baked goods came out, all you had to do was add water. You didn't have to add oil or eggs. It literally was as simple as mix water. I'm the chef of the day. They found that too little friction. All of these housewives of the fifties felt bad about themselves for not making something. And so they literally had to change the mix so that women could now add, and now hopefully men, eggs and water to make them felt. So I share that story to say, I think in FinTech we're in kind of a weird space that we're all used to such a crappy experience that a little bit of friction is sometimes a good thing. And lastly, transparency. I don't think anyone in the room would argue how important transparency is in finance right now. And so, it's become just a central theme of who we are at Zeno. Um, 
both as a company and what we're doing and what we stand for, but also where your dollars are going for. So just, you know, we started out transparently saying, here's the asset class we're working with and here's the good we're doing in the world. And we, re we were pushed even farther to say, no, tell me the specifics. I want to hear about Cindy. I want to hear about Detroit. I want to hear about the specific ways you're mobilizing my money. And so really just honing in on the fact that we are in a beautiful time of demanded transparency. And I think it's great. And, and, I, and I think it's table stakes now. My answer should be. And so the two things I'll just end on. Number one, as you guys know, if it was, if it was easy, someone would have done it, right? This is not easy stuff specifically because the regulatory environment, but it's so worth it. So I encourage everyone in the room that's fighting the good fight to keep going. And the second is, for us at CNOTE, it's about the North Star, right? It is really about knowing why you're doing it. We believe that finance can and should be an instrument for positive change. And so we're going to fight for that every day. So when it gets hard, whether on the compliance front or on whatever front, um, we've got that North Star of being able to deploy millions and then billions into the hands of those who need it the most. And that keeps us going. And so I hope that each of you find your own start. That's it.